Greetings, everyone. I am Father Bill Kelly, and on behalf of our unique community of faith in Harvard Square, where I serve as pastor and senior chaplain, I invite you to join us for the next hour as we enter into the spirit of Advent by viewing sacred art, gaining new historical perspectives on the nativity, and hearing some music of soaring beauty. Our community, the Harvard Catholic Center, St. Paul's Parish, and the St. Paul's Choir School, has pooled its resources and talents to bring you this two-program event entitled Picturing the Prince of Peace, Christ's Nativity in Art. We begin the first program now, and the second takes place in one week at the same time, Saturday, December the 12th at 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Please join us for that as well. Registration information will be provided later in the program. We start each program with an illustrated talk about how Christian artists during a seminal period have sought to reveal the mystery of God's Son coming into our world. As we'll see clearly in today's program, these artists had no proven formula to start with. They needed to bring all the resources of the creative imagination to the aid of faith. The result? In visual beauty, they have found ways to inspire us, to move us, and to invite us into the great mystery of the Incarnation. After each talk, we offer a brief performance of Advent and Christmas music by the Choir of Men and Boys at St. Paul's, one of very few traditional choirs of men and boys in the country. The boys, of course, are the choristers of our choir school the only Catholic boys choir school in the United States. Here, we provide a rigorous classical, academic, and musical education in the great cathedral tradition for grades three through eight in the heart of our campus here in Harvard Square. Both this program and the one offered next week will be archived on the St. Paul's Harvard Square YouTube channel. If you're moved and inspired by these programs, please share a link to that channel with family, friends, parishioners, fellow students, or colleagues. Before introducing our speaker, I want to thank the donors who provided financial support for today's program in memory of Francesco Chip Piatti, whose loss we mourned this year. Over many decades, Chip gave so much and so quietly to enhance the beauty of our buildings, to teach our tradition of faith, and to bring kindness to our community life. We are honored to have as our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Lev, an internationally known Rome-based art historian with degrees from the University of Chicago and the University of Bologna. In addition to teaching at Duquesne University's Italian campus and authoring several books, she has been giving tours of the artistic riches of Rome and beyond for over 20 years. The talk we are about to hear takes us to the very beginning of Christian art and to a fundamental question. How could artists present the one true God in a landscape littered with statues of pagan gods. Was it even possible? As Dr. Lev shows, the answer was a resounding yes. They pictured God made visible to all. So Dr. Lev, welcome. Would you unmute and turn on your video? Thank you. What a lovely introduction. I'm very grateful to be here, especially in these first days of Advent, to share uh, what is for me a little bit more than just a, oh, isn't this a lovely subject matter? The subject matter of the incarnation is really, as I will be talking about in this in this presentation, it's the reason for Christian art. It's what makes it 
possible for us to have this body of art that ranges from the stained glass in the in the cathedrals of France to the Sistine Chapel. This is this is a, a the the whole justification for this incredibly rich body of beauty that we've enjoyed for so many centuries. And the fact is that at the end of the day, if there had been no incarnation, I think I would probably be out of a job. So I'm always very happy to be able to talk about what made this possible. So today we're going to be discussing um, how the nativity came to be represented in art. And I'm going to be starting with uh, these whole idea of what did the what did the landscape look like? So let's start with this problem. We are very accustomed to images of the nativity. As a matter of fact, whether or not people recognize that Mary and Jesus, and you're looking at the savior, people look at the configuration of figures and most people will be able to recognize that this is some sort of Christian image that involves the birth of this incredibly important child to the Christian people. It's become something that, you know, it's a, it's a theme that you see on everything from a, I, I saw it on Christmas candy in the supermarket. So the theme has become so usual to us. Sometimes it's hard to take a step back and think about how revolutionary the concept of representing the birth of Christ was. And so let's start by looking at where this all took place. It took place, the story of Jesus begins in this, Jesus is coming to earth, the, 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 the word made flesh happens in this first century, just as the Romans are consolidating the empire all around the Mediterranean basin. So let's take a look at what the Mediterranean basin looks like in this period. What kind of gods are people worshiping? And of course, the great Roman overriding god of Jupiter, this huge, this, this Zeus turned Jupiter for the Romans, this enormous seated, all powerful figure, but a god that remains in Olympus, a god that doesn't really have much to do with everyday people. Then you move to Egypt, you have even bigger images of gods. Look around this Mediterranean basin and wherever we look, there are these distant uh, uh, deities. Some of them aren't even anthropomorphic. We move into these strange, almost talismanic deities, these, these, atro these atropaic figures that are meant to keep away evil. Very hard for a human being to relate to as we go from Moloch over here to uh, Kibele, and then we have this, this these, these figurines that are almost just um, uh, a kind of uh, a personification of the pure power of a deity. So this is what people are worshiping. These are the gods that fill the landscape of all the people in the Mediterranean. And so there's one more people one more people who are worshiping a God who are who is also not visible, but reveals himself in the most extraordinary ways, reveals himself in this, as this burning bush, reveals himself the God of the Jews who's promising this encounter, but the encounter seems distant. And when we look at this landscape and this promise that we have in this little teeny tiny corner of the Mediterranean, this dream of a people to see God face to face, look at how many times we see in the Old Testament leading up to John, the desire, the need, the, 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 the longing to see the face of God, to come face to face with the living God, and then it happens. But it happens in a way that nobody expects. The God doesn't, this God doesn't show up bigger than Zeus or bigger than Isis. This God appears as something very surprising and very unusual in a context that is almost chaotic. So this is a wonderful Persepe. There's a there's a tradition that was really, it's a really a very Italian tradition. It comes out of Naples of these very rich Persepe or these crush scenes and they're enormous scenes with a whole lot going on. And a part of the reason for the density of these images is to realize, to emphasize how small that event looked in the context of people going about their daily business, doing their things, following their, their, their own concerns. So we have in the little corner that teeny, 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 tiny baby that comes into this enormous setting of people shopping, cooking, repairing, working, talking, gossiping, playing, whatever it is they're doing. 
But always in these, we also see the seedling of what makes this such an important scene, this universality of what is happening in this teeny tiny little child coming into the world in the midst of a world where people are worried about their own business and their own own day-to-day -day activities but as this child comes in he's coming in for everybody so not one of these gods that is very separate and concerned with his only his own his own peoples but a God that is here for everyone. Now, what do I mean by that? Look at the different estates, if you will, that are present here. So we see the angels, we see that heavenly presence to remind us that that child is a divine child. Then we see the presence of the shepherds. We see the peasants, the people who are uh, uh, coming in from the outside, literally the, these, 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 these people who are not considered part of the uh, everyday structure of the society, but live out in the wilderness. And then we see the foreigners, the people who have nothing to do with this local area, but people who come from afar. So we're looking at the conjoining of heaven and earth in this child, and how that child's presence is meant to be known by everyone from the simple humblest of the local people that live outside the city gates to the furthest reaches of the empire they are all welcome to his presence and imagine how challenging this is now again we need to keep thinking about how unusual the way that jesus presents himself the way that god presents himself into the world in the same a few years, uh, uh, a few years before Jesus was born, Emperor Augustus did something incredible. He declared the first human being to become a god. So what you see on the left is the Prima Porta by of, of uh, the Prima Porta statue of Augustus, uh, sort of this deified Augustus. So the, this bare feet imagery shows us as an Augustus who's already proclaiming himself in waiting to be a god. But on the other side, you see the great action of Augustus, which is to declare the recently deceased Julius Caesar a god. And you're looking at a uh, a replica or a reconstruction of the Temple of Julius, a coin that was minted in order to celebrate the divine Julius. So exactly at the moment, let's think about this, exactly at the moment that the Romans have succeeded in declaring a human being to become a god and to put a temple in the middle of the forum to celebrate the human being who becomes a god, what happens? God becomes a human being. So from the very beginning, the presence of Christ in the world is already a challenge to what is going to be the central tenet of the Roman Empire that men become gods. And instead, God will show us that no, the great event is when God becomes man. And the Christians are going to be focusing on this because remember that the Christians will be persecuted for not being willing to recognize these men become gods, in particular, the men who become gods. So the Christians want to proclaim this incredible news. They want to talk about this, this, this extraordinary event. And the most effective form of communication in the Roman Empire is really imagery. The Romans have perfected imagery as a means of communicating, as a means of propaganda. And, and, and they've, they, from, from Greece to Rome, they've created these extraordinarily beautiful works that catch people's attention. So the Christians want to tell their story, but it seems that one of the means of communication is going to be blocked from them. Because after all, the first commandment makes it very clear that images, it shall not make in, images a form of anything in the heaven above the earth beneath or on the waters below. As a matter of fact, in the early years of Christianity, the Christians are extremely reluctant to make images. The first century pasts, uh, passes after Christ's death and resurrection. The second century is underway, and the Christians are discussing the question of images. In particular, we see Origen, who tries to explain why images are unnecessary. So as the Roman pagan Chelsus complains about the Christians who won't use images, who won't use this, this, this typical means of communication to proclaim their story, Origen explains that the, these statues, these works by Phidias or Polyclides are lifeless things. And so the true work of art is the soul in which Christ abides. So we have a whole, we're beginning, 
we're building up a whole apologetic for not using works of art. And then there's a breakthrough. When the Christians realize that because God has made himself visible, knowable, tangible, touchable, it is an open door to representing him. He wants to be known. He wanted to be known visually. He wanted the, the sense of sight to be able to, this, to gaze upon the face of the Lord. And so artists in turn begin to make their tentative representations of the Lord. And what you're looking at is one of the, it is the earliest image of the Madonna and child in, in Christian art. It is uh, one of the earliest images in absolute in Christian art. As you can see, there's a range of dates depending on the scholar, it, the, the dating is different, but basically it's somewhere between 180 AD and 220 AD. So we are looking at the very first time, as far as we know, that there was an attempt to represent the Madonna, the child, and what we are looking at is a figure, uh, an image that celebrates the incarnation. So we see a man on the left who is pointing upwards. And I'm actually going to give you a little bit of a close up and a watercolor that was done when the work was much, much more visible. This is in the catacombs of Priscilla and the atmosphere has you know, not been kind to the fresco over the years. But now we can look at this watercolor that was done pretty much as soon as the work was, was, was discovered. And so so you see this figure here on the left, who may be the prophet Balaam, who may be uh, uh, Isaiah. He may also be a wise man. It depends on who, who's, who's writing the article. But what you see is an, it is indicating upwards towards a star, not as easily visible in the photograph behind it, but very, very, very clear if you're standing underneath it or if you have an old watercolor of it, you see this star. So this prophecy of the virgin who will bear the child and the star that will indicate the arrival of the savior. Then you see Mary, who's sort of this large encompassing figure. She's sort of like a throne. She completely surrounds the body of Jesus. But the most interesting thing of all about this work, this helps us to identify what it is. So we know we're looking at an image of the Madonna and child. It's not just any other mother and child. We're looking at something that is specifically connected to the incarnation. But the most interesting part of this image, look at the face of the child. In any other image of this sort, there are images of mothers holding children who are nursing them. The child is turned away towards the mother. But in this first image of Christian art, the artist has the baby Jesus turn away from his mother to look directly at the viewer. And this direct, the direct eye to eye encounter, recalling even that encounter of Zacchaeus hiding in the tree and Jesus looks up and sees him there. This idea of Jesus who has come to visually encounter you as you visually encounter him, this exchange of gazes in the beholder. And imagine that that is the very first image we have of Jesus in the world. So it already tells us volumes about why we're making these images and why the image of this nativity is so important. So uh, the next challenging thing about the, uh, the birth of Christ is it's, uh, it has a lot to do with where he shows up. So you see four of these magnificent temples that people travel across the world to visit because they are vestiges of these amazing uh, uh, constructions built to honor the deities of Egypt, of, of Mesopotamia, of Greece, of, of Rome, standing on these high podiums, these gigantic figures, this power, everything in this architecture speaks of power, speaks of endurance, speaks of, speaks of overwhelming the, the, the viewer, the visitor, the beholder. But that's not the way that Jesus is going to come into the world. He, for his part, comes in in a cave. So instead of these enormous things placed on top of the hilltop, hilltops, we have Jesus coming into the world in this small enclosed cave. And that is going to present a very interesting problem as the Christians try to express this idea visually. It makes it very difficult because there are really no antecedents in Roman or Greek art for them to, to use so that a Roman or Greek can look at that image, figure out what it means, and then transpose the Christian meaning on it. So the Christians are going to have a little difficulty with the nativity. 
One of the things that, uh, stri that stands out in images of the nativity is that they will create a kind of um, uh, a structure for the manger. So you'll see him in a kind of stable. And this becomes a fairly common thing in these early images of the nativity. Uh, you're looking at the sarcophagus of Crispina, which is a fourth century, uh, sorry, is your, 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 sorry, you're, you're looking at a, a fragment of a sarcophagus from the fourth century, which is in the Vatican museums. And it has, uh, that's the upper part. And you'll see this kind of strange little roof. It's kind of interesting how much work the sculptor put into it. You can see little roof tiles, right? If anybody's ever been to Italy, you can actually still recognize that style of roof tile on many of the villages in, in Italy. So we have this little squared construction to create a very simple temple. So not to hide the humble nature of Jesus's birth, but nonetheless to give him a construction as people are accustomed to seeing deities in some form of a, a construction. And then of course, from pseudo Matthew, um, they will take the presence of the animals. And then off to the right, you see Mary seated in contemplation, the figure of the, the female figure with her hand uh, underneath her chin staring is an image that comes from the muses. It comes from, it comes from ancient Greco-Roman art. And it has, this is an image of contemplation. So Mary, who is contemplating her son, the son who is isolated except for the presence of the ox and the ass. And then you see the star in the upper right-hand corner, which again indicates to us that this is the, the coming of the savior. Below we have the sarcophagus of Crispina. And you see again, another image where you see once again, the, construct, the construction, a kind of careful construction of this, this stable. Uh, it's even more beautiful. This is quite a beautiful sarcophagus. You can actually see the tree trunks that are holding up that 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 roof, that little uh, tile roof. Uh, there is a there is a shepherd standing outside the building. Notice that Jesus is alone inside that structure with the ox and the ass. And again, for Roman visual language, it probably has something to do with. Um, it probably has something to do with these sort of sacrificial animals brought close to this space of the child. I would also say just as a, a point of admiring the workmanship of this, look how beautifully the wicker basket is rendered for the Christ child. So this idea of wicker was domestic architecture, one of the uh, domestic um, furniture. And in Roman houses, it was very common to have wicker chairs or wicker bassinets. And so you can see the care with which the carver has really put together this idea of something that makes the image very real. The child in swaddling clothes inside a basket that a Roman is very accustomed to seeing in his house. Trees holding up this, this stable. And then framed by these palm trees, these trees that are symbolic of this new Jerusalem, this image of victory. I also wanted to point out about this work, this really has little to do with anything, but I just happen to appreciate this point. This was made for a woman named Crispina. And if you look at her frame, this is that would be the center of the lid of her sarcophagus. If you look at the center, she's uh, framed by these two uh, palm trees, which again are symbols of victory, triumph, heaven. But what I find so fascinating about this is look what she's doing. This is a woman who is reading scriptures. I, just, I find that just, I, this has nothing to do with anything, but I just, I love this image of the fourth century woman depicted on her sarcophagus reading. So approaching the faith, not only with her heart, but with her mind. And I just, I, I love these little images that give us a view of women in antiquity, which is a little bit unexpected for what people usually say about that era. Um, this is the um, lid of the sarc sarcophagus of Stilico. This is in Milan. And um, this again is a fifth century sarcophagus made for the general who was very, very powerful in the age of Emperor Theodosius. And you can see how they really created quite the stylized system for the nativity where Jesus is kind of wrapped in this uh, uh, swaddling clothes and something that looks partially like a crib and partially like a tomb. And the two uh, animals are kneel side by side, which again is an allusion to uh, pseudo Matthew as well as the um, 
as well as the uh, 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 Old Testament um, uh, uh, prophecies of the ox, the, the, the ox and the animals knowing their master. The donkey will know its master. And it also begins to take on greater meaning. So we find authors in the um, we find authors in the fourth, really the fifth century, who begin to allude to the ox and the ass as the Gentiles and as the Jews. So what we're trying to do in this image, what the Christians are trying to do in this very clean, organized images, is to show the coming of these two peoples together, the pagans, the Gentiles, the nations, and the Jewish people converging on that Christ. And so it's already one of the big elements, and we're about to get into this in this talk, but one of the biggest elements in this imagery is the fact that Jesus comes into the world for everyone, which is not a given in ancient religions. Ancient religions tend to be very exclusive. So Christianity comes and opens the door for everybody. All peoples are meant to unite in, in, in salvation. And that is where this image comes from. We are again in the catacombs of Priscilla, which is one of the most extraordinary places in the world. And I strongly encourage you someday to make your way to Rome. The catacombs have to reopen. They're closed at the moment. But the uh, to make your way to see these works for yourselves, because they will not be around forever. They're already 1,700 years old, and, and, and they are the earliest Christian images we have. So we go back, we go from the earliest image of uh, the Madonna and child. And now we are looking at what is in the running for the oldest image of the three wise men or the epiphany. And as a matter of fact, the Christians, the early Christians will celebrate the epiphany first. The most important holiday for the incarnation was actually the epiphany. Uh, up until somewhere in the fourth century, I think it's 354 when December 25th becomes the official date for Christmas. But the epiphany took precedence insofar as a celebration over the nativity. This is true actually in customs of Italy, Italian customs up until or maybe only a couple decades ago, the Epiphany really was the main gift-giving holiday. So this idea of the, um, uh, 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 the manifestation, the seeing of God, and most importantly, God being seen by everyone. So the Christians who are using art to communicate with whom? Why do the Christians want to use art? Why do the Christians want to challenge the first commandment? Why do the Christians overturn our origins arguments? What are they trying to do? They are trying to speak to the Gentiles. And so the best way to proclaim the incarnation and the coming of Christ is to say, he came for you. And that image of the nativity Pow, the image of the epiphany powerfully expresses that. So we are looking at an, a very, very early, if not the first uh, uh, epiphany. The Madonna and child are almost completely faded away. As a matter of fact, we can't really see which way uh, Jesus is turning. But what is fascinating about these three figures is they look almost like cookie cutters, right? They look like those little sort of cookie cutters you make for Christmas cookies. They're basically identical in form. Um, they all are stepping forward. They're moving, they're in motion. And so the very first part of this work is that we're looking at three figures in motion and that the Madonna and child are still. So they are searching for something and that destination is where they stop is with those two figures. We notice they have these funny little hats and I will get to the hats a little bit later when we have an image um, which is a little bit clearer, but the hats den den denote them as foreigners. For a Roman eye, those hats are an indication of being not Roman. And the three separate colors, this, this, you can say, you, often you look at it with the green and the red and the white, you think, oh, the Italian flag was already underway. Those three colors and even the decision to, um, to make the wise men three is part of creating an image of universality. So 
obviously one main reason why you would have three wise men is because the three gifts that are told to us in Matthew's gospel is that the, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they're three gifts, they're three wise men. But there are images where you see one wise man. So it's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be three. But the eventual codification into three wise men also helps in a kind of a larger context in talking about how universal these wise men are. And as we move through images of the wise men, you'll see that three can be three ages of man. It can be youthful, middle-aged, old. It can be geographic. It can be Africa, Asia, Europe. It can be from the belief systems that were that were most dominant, Zoroasterism, the Jewish people, the 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 the, the, the Olympic gods, this, these, these different types of beliefs that are moving their way towards Jesus. So this, all these different, it's, it attempts to encompass the incredible diversity by kind of breaking into this three, everybody is searching for something and everybody finds the solution in that, in that finality of the presence of Christ. It's a, it's a very, very, very striking image and tremendously successful. It, 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 is, it is the, if in, in early Christian art, they are very parsimonious in the number of images they show. They don't want to overwhelm uh, the Gentiles as they're trying to tell stories from the Old and New Testament. They don't want to overwhelm them with too many images from too many different uh, uh, scenes. And so they have a very, very short list of images they use. And if they are going to use only one image from the life of Christ, they choose the epiphany. So it's to give you a sense of how important that scene is. Now we're gonna look at some variations. I love this one here. This is from Palermo. Um, it's a, again, fourth century, it's a catacomb image. And this time, first of all, I love the, I love Mary. Mary has, Mary has a North African face in this one. She's, she has, if you look at it, sort of the round face, that sort of ruddier color, it looks like the Sicily, which is extremely close to Africa. She has a very, very different somatic feature. She's actually quite beautiful. And interestingly, we have the three wise men who are approaching um, Jesus, but Jesus and Mary are again completely turned out towards the viewer. So you have the three magi, these three men who have come from afar, they're bearing their gifts, their journey is complete, but they're already looking to engage you on that journey. And again, you have this reliquary cap, uh, uh, casket. This was meant to contain uh, reliquaries, again, relics. It was made in the fourth century. Today, it's in the Louvre. It's a beautiful kind of gilt bronze affair. You see those palm fronds. And maybe you see a little bit better this sort of strange look of the, this one is a good example of the strange outfit of the wise men. The wise men always wear trousers, which is not in not part of the Roman wardrobe. So if you look, they wear trousers, they wear tunics, and they wear these funny little peaked caps. And for the Roman eye, for the Roman beholder, that distinctly renders these people others. They are not Roman. And it is a way of speaking to a Jesus who is not come for just the little group of people that he hangs around with, but he has come for people who are others, who are not part of the original circle. And for the Romans, this is very important. The Romans are not part of the original tradition. And so for the Roman empire to be able to immediately express visually that Jesus hasn't come for his own little hood, as it were. And this is very important in the Mediterranean where most religions are restricted to a little exclusive group of people, but he welcomes all those who come from everywhere. But for the Roman, that hat has one more significance, which is even greater. It's called a Phrygian cap, that little pointy, funny little hat they wear. And in Rome, the Phrygian, hat, the Phrygian cap was a symbol of a freed slave. So um, apply that to the image you're looking at. You have these three men who are searching. They find Jesus and they are freed from the slavery of sin. It's an incredibly beautiful way of going beyond the story of a journey to a place, to the story of the, the spiritual journey to be saved and, it, and, and, and that, that that spiritual journey is open to everyone. 
These are some more examples. I put this one in because I really like it when they put the camels in. Uh, you see this kind of, it's a sort of a pretty little pattern where you have the wise men, then the camel, wise men, camel, although they kind of look alike. Uh, you see a slight differentiation among the gifts. Uh, you see Mary holding Jesus is kind of stiff. She, she is again the throne and the front uh, wise man is pointing towards the star. Whereas this image here is a very interesting one in that there is a direct contact between the wise men and the Christ child. So the Christ child this time is actually taking the gift from the wise man. I think it's a very interesting image to see um, from the distance, we've been looking at more distant figures up until this point, the wise men stand here and Jesus is here. And then in this one, we have an actual contact where there's an exchange between the wise men who is handing the gift to the child who takes it. And an interesting thing uh, about the nativity, which I did not mention before, is that the nativity is usually annexed to an image of the epiphany. So as I said earlier, the epiphany is the preferred image, even though we think in terms of the nativity is in December, then the epiphany is in January. Um, the in, in early Christian art, it's really the epiphany that comes first. Then as of St. Helena, who is very interested in the... Um, in, in the relics of Jesus's life, um, begins a, an interest in, 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 in specifically what will be the nativity holiday, which then is codified in December as December 25th by 354 under Pope uh, Liberius. And so you'll see this kind of placing together, we're back in the sarcophagus of Crispina, we'll see this placing together of the nativity and the epiphany. Now, that's all very well and good, but as Christianity is legalized and becomes eventually the sole religion of the Roman Empire, we see more and more of uh, an imperial co-opting or an imperial appropriation of the three wise men. As a matter of fact, the magi that we've been looking at up until now have been magi who don't really look like kings, right? We don't, they don't seem to be, they're bringing great gifts, but they don't seem to be laden with the entourages, with the, with the, with the robes, with the crowns, with the complexity of their, these just seem to be uh, uh, travelers. They look like travelers who are coming from someplace else. When the empire gets involved in uh, commissioning art and being involved in the represent or paying for uh, Christian representations, we're going to see a slight adjustment that starts to take place um, in the wise men. And there are two, um, there are two uh, major uh, uh, forms of, uh, in which this takes place. One is they're gonna become more opulent. And the other is, um, trying to add more layers of theology to the story of the wise men than before. So this brings me to 340 AD in one of the most remarkable works of art in the Vatican Museums, or actually one of the most remarkable works of Christian art of all. It's called the Dogmatic Sarcophagus. It's from 340 AD. Uh, it was found uh, in Saint, it was found at Saint Paul outside the walls next to, I'm not kidding, the tomb of St. Paul. So the man who commissioned the sarcophagus, which is enormous, it's like the Bentley of sarcophagi, this man who commissioned this enormous sarcophagus got a pretty good parking place by getting it next to St. Paul. And what's interesting about it is it forces us to ask, who is this man? His portrait is incomplete. It was never uh, finished after his death, but we have a suspicion that he may have been present at the Council of Nicaea. And as a result, this sarcophagus which is absolutely unique, is called the dogmatic sarcophagus because in the Council of Nicaea, where they defined the creed, this sarcophagus of this man contains the oldest image in the history of art of the Trinity. And so on the far left-hand side, you see the father. The, the father is seated. The son is in front of him looking back and the Holy Spirit is on the other side. It actually follows the lines of the creed, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. So you see this conjoining of the seated figure into the standing figure, consubstantial with the Father, and through him all things were made. And here we see the creation of man and woman on the bottom. The Holy Spirit at the time of Nicaea is a little bit of a, a, little bit of a uh, question mark, so we see him just sort of standing there, but not 
not quite as clearly laid out as the other ones. And anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that it's a very, very, very well thought out sarcophagus to really think about the the theology of um, of the of the of the Trinity. Um, you have underneath it on the lower register, there you have the wise men, and now you have the differentiation. It's a beautiful piece of work. So you can see the crown containing the gold. You can see uh, the vases and the urns containing the frankincense and myrrh. You have a very, very good vision of the, um, of the pointed hats. We have, uh, we have the figure behind Mary, who is probably back to that prophet Balaam, for reasons that I'm going to get into a little bit later, that is not uh, Joseph. But what is fascinating, and this is amazing, look at the three wise men. Look, he's pointing up at a star but you've already seen that a bunch of times, except he's not pointing at one star, he's pointing at three stars. Because when you look at that child, you see them. You look at him, you see them. And so this epiphany becomes a gateway to even greater understanding of what the incarnation means in this extraordinary sarcophagus. And I'm just stopping for a moment for Pope St. Damasus, who is a figure uh, who is extremely successful, also because his feast day is coming up, but he is a figure who is extremely successful in negotiating Christianity to a very aristocratic uh, public. And so this is it, is, it is not only the work of the emperor that sees this transformation and how the um, Magi are represented, but this is also spurred by figures like Pope St. Damasus, who wants to make Christianity something that is accessible for these very uh, high aristocratic classes of Rome. And so when we start seeing the major constructions in, in, um, in, in, in Rome and in other imperial centers, the wise men are going to figure into it constantly. And as a matter of fact, this is the 450 AD, uh, representation of the um, of the of the the Epiphany um, in the mosaic over the apse of Saint Mary Major in Rome, which is the church which is in back of me here. Um, it is the Nativity Church par excellence. It is a church that was used uh, for uh, Christmas. Is a church that was used for uh, uh, the station church for the papacy for many, many centuries. What is fascinating about this one, it, they don't show you the image of the nativity. This is going to be the church in the wealthiest hill in Rome. It's on top of the Esquiline Hill. It's where all the senators live. It's where everybody who's part of the imperial court lives. So there's no image of this stable and this ox and this ass for this group of people who wouldn't be able to understand that. In Instead, they show the presentation in the temple, and they will show, they will move from there into the, the, the epiphany. This has a very, very, very important aspect to it, though. The uh, apse mosaic in St. Mary Major from 450 is the first image in the history of art that shows St. Joseph. So the figure over here on the right in the, in the orange mantle and the short tunic is Joseph. Mary is wearing the queen outfit. So not this poor girl of Bethlehem stuff. She shows up in her princess robe because again, remember the, um, remember the audience. Joseph is not placed into nativity scenes earlier or epiphany scenes earlier, mostly because it, they don't want to create confusion in the idea of the Romans. The importance is to emphasize the divinity of Christ. And so they're very, very concerned with kind of this heavenly father and they keep Joseph off to the side until Christianity is legalized and much more of a uh, sort of a common religion for everyone so that they can sort of teach the presence of Joseph and why he's there uh, much more clearly. The Jesus of the epiphany here is a little man sitting on a throne. So it becomes much more uh, uh, imperial looking. Uh, this is where my wise men become my favorites because they're wearing these fabulous polka dot outfits. I love the clothes on the, on the wise men. In this one, from the doors of Santa Sabina in Rome, so exactly the same period, another major church on the 
Aventine Hill, um, the wise men are back to their usual traveling robes, but look how Mary and Jesus are placed on a very, very high throne. So kind of like the way the temples are placed on top of very high podia. So we're beginning to look at a very uh, uh, majestic image of the epiphany. And then, of course, in what will become the capital of the Roman Empire after Rome, the capital moves to Ravenna. And in Santa Polinari Nuovo in Ravenna, we have the first image of the three wise men with their names. And their names come from the Armeno Vangelo, the, the, the Armenian Gospel, which was written in the in end of the sixth century, where we see for the first time Balthazar, Melchior, and Caspar, and we see them in this late sixth century mosaic uh, represented wearing, I think, um, I think Caspar is wearing leopard skin pants, which is really great. They're still wearing their little red Phrygian caps. You still see the um, you still see the palm trees in the background, but this tremendous sense of wealth and privilege, which is then uh, also in San Vitale, also in Ravenna. When we look at the mosaic uh, by the apse of San Vitale, we see the picture of Empress Theodora. So now we're looking at the queen consort, wife of Justinian, and look at the hem of her robe. Again, the three wise men finding a role for these, um, uh, finding a role for these extremely important patrons who identify themselves more and more with the figures of the Magi. And so uh, it gets to the point where we see uh, the, the relics of the Magi, which are taken uh, to Constantinople. From Constantinople, they are brought from Milan to Milan. And then with the rise of the Holy Roman Empire. So as of 800, we have the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, in uh, 1100, Barbarossa, the Holy Roman Emperor, Federico Barbarossa, takes the um, relics of the wise men to bring them closer to himself and to make it part of the imagery of the Holy Roman Empire and has this magnificent uh, reliquary made for them in um, in the, in, the, in the Cologne Cathedral. So this image now of the wise men as wealthy. And that brings us into uh, Florence and the Renaissance. And the Renaissance picks up on this theme. It's an ancient tradition in the Republic of Florence where people became extraordinarily wealthy, very, very, very successful in a very, very short time. And these bankers and merchants who are doing extremely well, but wonder how to participate in the society as very wealthy men. And so they began this company of the Magi, which involved an elaborate parade in the city of Florence, which culminated in this um, Labyrinth cities, which culminated uh, in these, they all dressed up, the, the great merchants of Florence dressed up. And um, they did a great many good and charitable works for the city. And so we see the return of the Magi now as a kind of representation of the, of the very sophisticated world of the Renaissance. So I thought I would just show you a couple of these. They're so exceptionally beautiful. This Gentile da Fabriano, where you see the whole long procession of the Magi from the deep distance coming to the foreground. You see the differentiation, the young man, the middle-aged man or the, the mature man and the old man all together. This incredible wealth and luxury that culminates in the little nude baby Jesus. So that juxtaposition of the poverty of Jesus and the wealth of the wise men. This is the chapel that was built for the Medici family in Palazzo Medici Riccardi. Again, an entire room. I just gave you one picture, but it's an entire room where you are completely surrounded by these elaborate, incredibly beautifully dressed wise men. But when you look above the altar, there's a very simple picture of the shepherds adoring Christ. So we're beginning to play with this idea of the opulence of the wise men versus the simplicity of the um, the simplicity of the, uh, the, the shepherds. And as we move into the late 15th century, something really beautiful happens. Sandra Botticelli and Leonardo da Vinci, who I could spend a whole other hour talking about their very peculiar relationship, there's a kind of a, they're frenemies as it were, they change the wise men imagery. 
And what both of them have, they look wildly different, even though they're made really just a few years apart from each other. What they create is an image of yearning. Look at those faces. This is an unfinished work on the left, the Tempera by Leonardo. Look at those faces of yearning, this, this desire and bringing back in the way that only Renaissance art can, that desire and longing and wonder of seeing God. So you have a myriad of different expressions and different ways that people react before the presence of God. And on the right-hand side, you have, you have um, Botticelli doing very, very much the same thing, creating what we call the desio. Look at these bodies lurching, uh, uh, drawn towards the presence of the child. Not the kingliness of the child, but this incredible desire. We, we come back to that desire to be in the presence of God. And I'm closing um, on an altarpiece, which I it just it's a it's a, it's from the same period. It's a early 16th century altarpiece called the Maria Far altarpiece, and this incredible sense of universality. And so there are four images from the life of Mary, including, of course, the wise men. And now you see the geographic differences as the world is getting bigger and the discovery of the new world and these representations of all these different places. You have Mary. Jesus, the different ages, the older Casper, this, this sort of mature man and the younger man here. But now look what you have. Three different geographic origins. You have an African man, you have a Semitic man, you have the, you have the, the, the Caucasian man all drawn together before Christ. And so that again, that fullness of the universality, but with a wonderful little touch. Look over here at the right-hand corner. Do you see this guy who's close to hand on his chin looking up at the Turkish flag? So these two figures sort of representation of, of, of people, the, the, the contact they have with people who look like this, they tend to be Turks. So you see the Turkish flag in the corner, these people looking up with perplexity. Joseph, who seems to be peering around the corner a little nervous about these unusual visitors. So this almost a way of teaching people how to welcome the diversity that Christianity will bring. Yes, they're going to be different. Yes, you're going to be perplexed, but they are all, oh, you're all meant to be together peacefully before the Prince of Peace. And so on that note, um, I just want to add with one little fun fact about this, uh, this church. Uh, this church, the Maria Farr Church, is slightly outside Salzburg. And that same church is where 23-year-old choir master, or the assistant priest, I'm sorry, the 23-year-old assistant priest, Joseph Moore, wrote the, wrote the lyrics or wrote the poem that became the lyrics of Silent Night. So from here, I'm going to segue out of pictures, the joy of the eyes into the joys of the ears with music. So Dr. Lev, uh, thank you so much for this inspiring journey through the beauty of a God made visible to all. And we look forward to continuing that journey next week as you take us through the new understanding of Christ's nativity flowing especially from the spirit of St. Francis of Assisi. The title of next week's talk is Humanity Elevated Through the Incarnation, St. Francis, the Franciscans, and Beyond. I invite all of you to join us next week by registering at the link shown on the screen if you have not already done so. Also, remember that these two programs will be archived on the St. Paul's Harvard Square YouTube channel. So please share that link with others if you would. I'd also invite you to join us for a full one hour virtual concert of Advent and Christmas music with our St. Paul's Choir, which premieres on Saturday, December the 19th. And you can find more information at www.christmasinharvardsquare.com. One big long word, christmasinharvardsquare.com. And finally, you'll be receiving a brief survey about this program by email. It would be a great help to us if you'd take a minute to provide your feedback and send it to us. I'm now very happy to turn the microphone over to James Kennerly, music director of the St. Paul's Choir School, to introduce a delightful selection of Advent and Christmas music. And now, Mr. James Kennerly. Thank you so much, Father Kelly. Thank you so much, Professor Lev. What a fantastic and fascinating talk that was. 
Um, and what we thought we would do is accompany what you've just seen with some of the sounds or certainly some of the texts that those artists may have heard. Uh, at the very beginning of the show, if you tuned in early, you would have heard two settings of the Marian antiphon, Alma Redem Taurus Mater. And this is an antiphon we sing starting in Advent, going all the way through to the Feast of Candlemas, which is the 2nd of February, the presentation of Christ in the temple. Um, and of course, it's sung at the end of Compline as we particularly draw the day to a close and we think of the Virgin Mary and invite her to join us in our prayers. Musically, the Christmas season and Advent season have been defined by choral music and it's hard to imagine life without that. Um, Father Kelly mentioned that St. Paul's is home to St. Paul's Choir School, which educates the boy choristers for the only Catholic boarding um, choir school in the country and one of only a handful in the world. And what we have done instead of performing live concerts this year, we recorded um, some selections and you're going to see some of those today. The first is going to start off where we left off in the talk and that is with a beautiful setting of Silent Nights. Now this wouldn't have been around in the Roman times, but I think the aesthetic of the Silent Nights text, which was written in 1818 by Franz Xavier Gruber and the lyrics written by Josef Mohr, um, in a beautiful church, as you saw in Salzburg. Um, that was first performed in Christmas Eve in that year. And it's arranged by my predecessor, Ted Marier, who founded the choir school. And before we listen to this, I did want to mention the notion of miracles because we are in the middle of a miracle. You can see behind me um, a screenshot from our recording with the boys and men, um, St. Paul's Choir. And it was truly a miracle that we were able to do that in this extraordinarily difficult time um, where we have to be socially distanced, we have to wear masks, and we were able to pull an innumerable, um, innumerable things together to make that happen logistically and musically. Um, and so this is one of those many miracles, another of which was that Ted Mario was able to found the choir school in an extremely difficult time in the 20th century where music wasn't valued in the same way that it was for the hundreds of years before boys choirs have been going on for over a thousand years. Um, unfortunately, how it is now valued in the 21st century. So this is a very beautiful arrangement by Ted Marier of Silent Nights.
So at the end there, you heard our pre-choristers, our third and fourth grade singers, some of whom have just been singing with us for a few months. Um, and it's going to be a fabulous transformation for them and for all of us over the next few years as we see them grow into fantastic musicians. We're now going to sing a piece that's more distinctly Advent in nature and really harks back to the very beginnings of the Advent Christian spirituality that surrounds this period um, and also brings us into the 21st century in the fact that I composed the music in 2016 to a medieval English text that was in a manuscript that dates from about 1400. Adam Lee Bound and of course is a meditation on the famous story of Adam and Eve from the third chapter of Genesis and it's one of those stories in particular that choristers and school people, schoolboys absolutely love because they have to deal with the snake and the fall of man, original sin, all of those fun things that we love to talk about um, around this time of year. The text is also great for boy choristers because it is macaronic, meaning that it has a mixture of languages, in this case, medieval English and also Latin. Uh, but it's a fantastic text because in the third verse, um, we see not only Adam lay bound and bound and in a bond, 4,000 winter thought he not too long. So everything is rather doomy and gloomy. But in the third verse, we see that the subsequent redemption of man through the birth of Jesus Christ by Mary, who becomes, of course, the queen of heaven. And so the very end of the text is in Latin, Deo gratias. And it's a little bit like Aquinas's concept of the idea of the Felix culpa, the blessed fault. So this is a setting that I distinctly looked back um, to a, a medieval folklore-like musical language to bring that sense of belonging and place and time. So this is a setting of Adam Lee Bandon.
and we're going to conclude this afternoon's session with uh, an extraordinarily beautiful setting of the Ave Maria, although actually the composer Franz Bibel, who was born in 1906 and died in 2001, uses parts of the Angelus text and the Ave Maria text. And these hark back to the 11th century, where the monastic tradition begins reciting the Angelus three times a day at the sound of the bell. And of course, we do that today at St. Paul's and many other churches around the world. One church I served in Midtown, New York City, had the Angelus bell going off. And one time, one of the doormen said to me, I, you know, I get the hour bells, but what on earth are these other bells that go off 10 minutes before and they go off three times a day? And so I had pleasure in explaining to him where that tradition came from, although I imagine many people around the world are confused with these irregular bells sounding. Um, Munich was the site of our choir tour, Bavaria, as well, this last winter. And that is where the composer was born, Franz Bibel, and where he worked. And this piece started out for male voices. It's performed here, of course, with boys' voices and with male men's voices. Um, but it was originally written for, for men's voices, broken voices. And it was made popular in this country by the all-male vocal group Chanticleer. Um, but it was actually composed for a group of firemen because in the 1950s, the, one of the firemen sang in Bibel's choir in Munich and he and his fellow firemen were doing a choral competition and they asked Bibel to compose this piece for them. So it has um, wonderfully humble beginnings and it's since become one of the great best loved Advent and Christmas traditions. This is Franz Bibel's Ave Maria. And before I let you go, I'd like to remind you, as Father Kelly said, you can watch this and many more on our full concert version of these performances by visiting Christmas in harvardsquare.com. Not only is this a wonderful thing to do at this time of year when we all need live music and we all need community, but it's a lovely gift for Christmas. And so if you'd like to watch it for yourselves or give it as a gift to someone that you care about, then please go to the website and you can read all about it. Thank you so much. Here is Franz Bibel's Ave Maria.
Well, what a wonderful presentation of sight and sound for us today. Thank you all so much for joining us and thank you to all of those uh, behind the scene who have made this afternoon happen. And a special thank you to James Kennerly and especially to Dr. Elizabeth Lev. We hope that you can join us again next week for part two of our series. If I could, I'd just like to offer you an Advent blessing. May Almighty God bless you and your family to come to know the loving and living Christ as he comes into our lives, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.